Welcome back to the True Footy Podcast brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped is dedicated to helping you level up your full body grooming routine. They forever change the grooming game with the new Perfect Package 3.0. The Perfect Package 3.0 comes with the Essential Lawn Mower 3.0, which is a waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine. This is the best trimmer on the market for those of you in need of a chest shave. Their third generation trimmer features a ceramic blade with skin safe technology. You can adjust settings to get the length you like. No, not that length. And you can stay on top of it with almost no effort at all. Does the trimmer add girth? If only. In addition to the world class trimmer, make sure you use their product, the Crop Cleanser, which is a body wash to keep your hair and skin healthy and fresh. Inside the Perfect Package 3.0, you'll also find the Manscaped Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer because we know how painful chafing can be when you're wearing your bathing suit all day. And summer is just hanging on a little bit longer than we expected, Bush, plenty of hot days still, and plenty of ball sweat, can I say? Absolutely. And in those sweaty situations, you'll also find the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. A testy tone of it's designed to give you a pep in your step. Subscribe to the perfect package and get a new blade refill every three months for your lawnmower 3.0 delivered to your door. For a limited time, get two free gifts. The shed travel bag, I used mine the other week actually when I went camping, it was quite handy. And the panted high performance Manscaped anti-chafing boxes. Wow, that all sounds delicious. And the exciting news we have for you today is you can actually get 20% off their elite ball grooming products using the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word. And in addition to that 20% off, you also get free shipping. So it's an absolute bargain. So just to repeat that guys, go to manscaped.com and you will get 20% off their products and free shipping if you use the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word. Thanks guys, enjoy the podcast. All right, welcome back to True Footy Podcast 72. They're really starting to pile up, Busher. Two or three, we were a bit confused. I think mean, we 72 in the end. Okay, yeah, yeah, nice. We do this little thing yep. every time we start a podcast. We're like, actually, is it this? But yeah. yeah. No, it's been a little while. It's been maybe three or four weeks since we recorded the predictions one. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, at least three or four. Uh, our most ever watched on YouTube podcast as well. Oui. So, uh, yeah, thank you to everyone who got around that. Really appreciate the support. As you'll notice, uh, young Lenny is not with us today, but that is not because he... Uh, wasn't invited. He hasn't been booted. There's been a lot of really good comments from uh, really good feedback around Lenny, and people want to see more of him. And um, that's the plan. Like happy to have him. It's more the fact we're recording on Saturday, and Saturday is is his busy day, especially yeah, now that right. the season's on. He's always traveling to different Waffle Colts games True. and stuff. Good point. Yeah. Basically, his work day for in terms of his footy commission stuff. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the Saturdays. Yeah, true. I actually didn't think of it like that. That makes sense. But yeah, uh, he was invited, uh, as was Druzy, and uh, he couldn't make it. And um, Dylan. Uh, my roommate from Coldworld, also uh, busy today playing football. So, back with the dregs. Oy. I'm just kidding. Just <laughs> Scum. <kidding>. Yeah. <laughs> nah, but just with uh, an old school podcast, just you and me. Um, a vintage. Yeah, a classic. And um, we are also reverting back to one of the podcasts where we get a lot of input from our Discord users. Yeah, it's um, been a while with the Discord questions, actually, I yeah, will say. Yeah, yeah, too. We often just have something more pressing that we want to discuss as well so we don't always use the um the questions but in this pod um we've had some really awesome questions so thank you for everyone who contributed um really gets us by get around the discord we haven't plugged that in a while yeah that's true that's true i I think the reason we stopped plugging it was because it uh, it got like spammed and then um basically people asked me to stop advertising it so much and then bring it back but anyway long story short yes we do have a discord um out there as well so yeah all right we'll get straight into it um as we record this we, we should say it is round two and uh the two games that have happened so far this round are carlton collingwood and geelong and brisbane last night which was uh ended in quite a bit of controversy um so as we're looking up at the screen now it is uh, sydney's playing adelaide at six to twelve so uh anything that happens from this moment on uh if it's not in this podcast so for instance if somebody does something quite heroic heroic we're not mentioning it because it hasn't happened yet so that's our excuse um, but we'll get into the rest of the podcast. Um, well, our last potty was the predictions one um, around the time of the preseason as well. We talked a little bit about um, the way like the rule changes were impacting the game, but now obviously there's a lot, lot more of a body of work where we can sort of assess the way uh, those rules have affected the game so far, and that kind of leads into our first question from Michael Stanton. Um, what do you think of the new man on the mark rule, Bush? 
I'm not big on it because like, it's always been a part of the game. Like if you see the guy sort of running on the angle to sort of try and play on, you're allowed to sort of react to it, and that's just been a part of footy. And the fact they're trying to get rid of that, it's just another example of Steve Hawking gone mad, basically, I think. Mm. I think the worst case scenario with the man on the mark rule is we see lots of 50s. That's the worst case scenario. So is provided the players are adapting to it and not giving away too many 50s, which I think they have compared to the yeah. preseason, as far as my eye test goes, um, it doesn't seem as bad in terms of... Because that's the most frustrating yeah. thing. If somebody just missteps by one meter, or like, sorry, one step... Um, it could influence the game quite a lot. So that's that's not what we want to see. But and ironically as well, I think with the more 50s, it slows the game down more because they're bringing in these rules to try and like, bring up yeah. the pace of the game. But with more 50 meter penalties and stuff, it's more time guys trying to get the ball down. Other teams mm. can set up while that's going on. That's true, they can set up. But I mean, I, I, yeah, you're right. I just don't think the 50 meters is part of the intention. I think the intention yeah. is uh, to just move the ball quicker. And I think yeah. we're seeing a big Big impact generally across the league. Um, I'll come up with some stats here, and I blatantly stole this from On The Couch. So if you don't have a uh, subscription to KO or Fox Sports, uh, this is great content for you, but I will admit <laughs> that I just completely stole this. Uh, no, just some interesting um, stats that came out from that, from that show. Um, scoring, well, actually, I'll just say anecdotally, like scoring seems higher. I don't actually know the stats on that, but I feel like we've saw a few more high-scoring games than we would otherwise would. Uh, but what has increased is scores from the back half. I think it's from like 36% to 42%, which are fairly significant. Um, and they made the point on the show that scores from the back half are far more attractive than scores from the front half because um, obviously when, when the ball's locked in your front half, you get pretty much yeah. the whole field in there. When it comes from your back half, that's where you see rebounding football, you see good skills, quick ball movement. Um, so we are seeing an effect take place there. Um, this is also pretty wild. One in three kick-ins now result in an inside 50 <laughs> so that shows how... Oh, what, for the team kicking it in? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the okay. team who's kicking out of the back half. So, I mean, we'll, we'll also contextualise that and say that's not simply because of the man of the mark rule. That's more likely to do with uh, the... Uh, well, maybe two reasons, but first of all, the kick-in now... Um, 15 and There's a much bigger guard where players can run out and launch the ball into the centre square pretty much mm. every time. Um, we're seeing a big impact there. So it was previously like 19% of um, kick-ins resulted in inside 50 it's nearly doubled to 33%. So, uh, yeah, long story short, we're seeing the ball move across the field a lot quicker. It's a full full court game, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, in terms of numbers, the rules are having the effect that people want to see. And I think a lot of people must agree that the football was attractive, more attractive. Do you feel like it was more attractive this round? From what bits I saw, it was like mm. more flowy, but I didn't catch too much the first round because I right. was camping. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a euphemism. Um and even the Dockers game was listening on the radio and cracked the shits pretty quickly, especially because oh, yeah. the reception wasn't that good. So we did stream that on Drew's YouTube channel, yeah. the Fremantle game, and um, that really pissed them off. But we do have a Fremantle question uh, later in this pod, so we'll, we'll get to that. Yep. Um, some other points just from that. Um, yeah, I guess for me to more answer directly to Michael, what do I think of the rule? I think, yeah, provided there's no 50s, it also looks a bit ugly. I, one thing I do cringe at is when a bloke's literally just walked like 15 metres diagonally left to where the mark was originally taken and he's not calling play on. So I, I would probably say I'd like, the, I'd, I'd like to see it where the, the man of the mark doesn't move and uh, the umpire is quicker to call play on. Mm. So a happy balance there because they, they are taking the piss a little bit. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, just just players like walking like fifteen meters diagonally off uh, the line of the kick, uh, and no one's calling play on. But um, I, I like the effect it's had, and I think that I think the game is more attractive in this round. Um, there's also factors like the shorter, the lower interchange cap, which is Michael's next question. Do you think the inter- interchange cap reductions uh, mean that athletes will be prioritised over more pure footballs going forward? I guess first of all, what did you what do you think about capping interchanges? Eh, yeah, like. I can't. I get why they're doing it, but again, it's sort of like you're kind of forcing teams to sort of put guys in situations where they might get hurt, rather than sort of give them the flexibility of managing their own guys' minutes, managing that stuff. It sort of takes that away from coaches, takes away from strategy, I guess. Like it kind of increases strategy. It does in some ways, but yeah, yeah. I think there's there's two sides of it for me. So the the logic behind the rule change is uh, more fatigue on the player or more demand on the players will result in them not being able to play a manic defensive pressure style because the manic defensive pressure game style is literally what um, 
leads to congestion. It leads to the ball being locked up and low scoring and the ball not moving fast. So they're basically saying, hey, you're not going to be able to apply that much pressure and uh, keep the ball so hot. Um, the, therefore, you're with these interchanges, you're going to have to be more conservative. Um, and so far, it appears it's had uh, the desired effect. But the next question is, do you think the cap reductions mean that over for, going forward, like from, uh, from a draft perspective, if you're looking at adding players to your list, do you think you would be more looking at someone like a Billy Hartung, your Chris Mastins in the draft who are a bit shorter, maybe not as skillful, but they can run all day uh, versus you know more pure football? What do you think on that? I'd still go the skilled footballers because the endurance side of things, a lot of these skilled good footballers do have a good solid endurance base that they usually build on with a few years in the system. Like They might not be the kid that got a 16 beep test at the thing like Billy Hartung did when he was 18, but look how mm-hmm. Billy Hartung's career panned out versus someone who might have got like an 11 or a 12 beep test that's been a few years in the system, built up that endurance base and is probably close to that level there. So... You, I'd rather go the skillful player and back them in to get the endurance because endurance can be built. It's not like fast twitch muscle fibers and vertical leap and strength and stuff. Endurance is yeah something that can be developed over time. Yeah, it is. It stands to reason that you'd say that it's harder to make an endurance athlete a gun footballer than it is to make a gun footballer at least a pretty good endurance athlete. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I get what you're saying there. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I Mike's uh, Mike, <laughs> Michael. Um, his question. Yeah, I mean, like we've seen, we've seen over the course of like ten years of following the draft, the way that there's they trends. had their athlete phase. Yeah, they, well, there was an athlete. There was a big body midfielder trend around the time Joe Botson and Michael Barlow yeah. were like up there, and Josh P. Kennedy. Um, and then that they sort of went away from that as well, and now it's all about more ball, uh, ball use and foot skills. I, I still think. There's still got to be a great emphasis on foot skills and decision making going forward because uh, because if we're playing more of a back half game or at least a full court, full field game, um, transitioning the ball from end to end is super important as well. So I think you may see a little bit of a snap where they're taking more into consider- consideration a player's endurance, but overall I still think they're going to preserve the interest in natural footballers and the thing is with the guys that run miles per game like your wingers and stuff that are running the most distance they're the guys you want with the ball in the hand because they're the ones that provide that run and carry they're the ones that hit the targets and get that stuff going so they mm. are prerequisite of that position to be skilled so you shouldn't yeah. be targeting endurance athletes hoping they get skilled yeah I guess so I get, but I guess that's the question are you a much better player a much better chance to get drafted if you're not necessarily the best kick but you can run a 16 beep or whatever the elite I level is. I don't think so these days. Like, yeah. there's such a premium placed on your ability to kick these days. Like, yeah, yeah. The days yeah. of butchers seem to be dying out a bit. Like, for sure. Like your Prudacy type midfielders, your Blakeleys, even like mm. a. Here's another example of those sort of butchery. For looping, uh, lumping uh, Matthew Prudis and Connor. Well, because he's the same group. <laughs> well, here's the example you always use. I'm like, joking. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know those you, Ilka characters. I understood what you meant. I think it just yeah. sounds funny. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So uh, overall, um, the rule changes I'm actually fairly positive on, even though they seemed a bit heinous at the start. Uh, what do you think of the medical sub? Yeah, I don't mind the idea of it. Like, it's, like it gives you coverage if someone gets hurt. Yeah. So people are complaining about the way that it could get mis- misused. So just to clarify for anyone who doesn't fully understand it, I think it was originally going to be um, as Buddy lines up for goal 945, I think. Yeah. Um, it was originally it, going though. to be a concussion protection sub. Hey, he's kicked a great goal. Oh. Um, <laughs> it was meant to protect against uh, concussions. Okay, yeah. so um, obviously if the player goes off, uh, you're one rotation down, you can sub the player on and there's less pressure to try and make the concussed guy yeah. okay to go back on the field for the sake of rotations or whatever. Less pressure on doctors. But I think they relaxed it so that if you have any major injury and the player's ruled out, uh, you can... Um, you can use the sub for that. Now, there's also criticism about the way that coaches are saying, oh, yeah, no, he's uh, he's rolled his ankle. We're going to have to take off our worst player and put on our sub for an extra runner, you know what I mean? Or yeah. take off our key position because it started raining, whatever. Yeah. Um, that being said, I think I see the benefit of it because this is a physically demanding season for the players. Obviously, the season, shorter pre-season, um, longer season this year and longer games. So the risk of potential injury seems higher. I think that's a fair... We've assumption. already seen a lot of injuries. Yeah. Oh, we have, yeah. and we've seen the medical sub used 
virtually yeah. every, not not every game, but like I'd say Even more than half. Three going quarters. into the season, we saw a lot of injuries. Players, yeah. Like towards the end of pre season, that sort of stuff. There's been a lot of injuries this year, so certainly probably almost essential this year. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think it's uh, I think it's something we can do to support the players and take the the, the load off, so to speak. The, uh, the iffy the one is though, guys, but like, are the medical sub but don't actually get subbed in when it counts as a game? That's one. Yeah, that's, a bit... that's an really interesting point. Is what we yeah. saw on um, or I saw on the, on the couch. So Connor Downey was the medical sub for Hawthorne, and when they won by what point against Essendon last week, he took off his t-shirt, was wearing a Hawthorne jumper, and joined the circle, huh. and was. Yeah. Gatorated, <laughs> well, I assume, but yeah, uh, no, that seems odd. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't, I feel like if you don't start on the, or sorry, if you don't ever play yeah. throughout that game and you're unused sub, you shouldn't count. That shouldn't count. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Wonder what happened with unused subs back when they last had a sub thing because there were. I don't think there were any unused subs. To I be think honest. it happened like once or twice. It was like really? very rare, but there were times yeah. where teams elected not to use it. Yeah, but very, know. very rare. I don't know. My opinion is if you don't come on, it doesn't count as a yeah, game. Yeah, that's where I'm at with it as yeah. well, for sure. Which is an easy thing to fix. Yeah. You just simply don't count it. That's nothing <laughs> wrong with the rule. But anyway, um, I do want to talk about the uh, the docu- docu-series making yeah. their mark. Um, I'll clarify, we're not paid to promote making their mark. But uh, I'd love to be sponsored by Amazon Prime, so yeah, we'll, we'll put that into the universe. Caden McDonald uh, did a bit of work for them, as did yeah. Dill Buckley. Um, but I'll, And he did a review on it, and it was a good review. But uh, I'll clarify that we are not um, not affiliated. Not that cool. So this is just a couple of handsome fans of the game um, talking about the uh, the docu series. So what what did you think of it? From what I've seen, like it's been some interesting insights in like particularly the Corona year, like seeing like the decision making process when shit first hit the fan, like getting that like with the fact that it's pretty much they're giving you the whole Richmond perspective, so you get to see the full club perspective, from, like CEOs, president, coach, all that stuff. But then the other individuals they had for the documentary got to see it from their perspective too like seeing Eddie Betts and stuff like with his family and having to deal with going into hubs and stuff was mm. an insight that you wouldn't normally get yeah it was really really good uh, I was really blown away by the production of it the yeah. the quality of the shots um, not that I am really an expert on this even though I have I own a camera um, <laughs> No, but two cameras. I do. I do slightly have a greater, more appreciation for editing and yeah, yeah, I don't want to sure. say filmmaking like a wanker because I mm. know nothing of it. But I do notice these things a bit more. And yeah, it's yeah. just like the camera shots, the the times to use when they, uh, the the times they chose to use a voiceover or stuff like that. I just thought, wow, it just yeah. looked immaculate. I got to say, at times, particularly in the first episode, it gave off a non funny Chris Lilly vibe. At times, <laughs> that's just what it felt like to me. Like just like non funny Chris Lilly characters. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. Like yeah. the first episode, but then it went away from that. But like when they were introducing like everyone, it just felt like a bit mm. Chris Lilly-ish yeah. without being funny. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, true. I, I know what you mean when yeah. you say that. Yeah, uh, yeah, because it was hard because there was no narration. You're yeah. purely, purely constructing a narrative off, um, off just yeah. snippets with players and and stuff like that. So with that, that seems like it would be hard. Yeah, to do. documentaries would be an interesting one to make, just mm. generally. Yeah. For sure. Especially when you've given the degree to just film hours of inside footage and interviews and stuff. Yeah, like. yeah. It would be cool. Yeah. Um, what, I guess what other takeaways did you take from it? Um, one thing that interested me is there's been a bit of talk about Stephen Cornelio's captaincy. Have you? Did you really have an opinion uh, on that? He looked good from what I've seen. Like, he obviously struggled last year on the field, like, particularly in certain patches. But, like, from what we saw off the field with the footage and stuff, it looked like he was trying to do, like, still trying to lead his guys, still yeah. trying to set a good example, even though he wasn't necessarily performing. Like, the interesting insight was, like, when he was admitted, like, even Leon Cameron said it in the footage, he's saying, we could have said he's just rolled his ankle, we could have said whatever reason to give him a week off, but Cornelio went to him and said, nope, you're dropping me, say, put it out there, but I've been dropped, mm. rather than try and cover it up with, like, a rolled ankle or something. Yeah. So that degree of accountability is inspiring from a captain i'd say that's true that's true i think yeah there's no doubt that kenny lewis seems like a good guy yeah um but i just thought it was interesting to to contrast the way that rory sloan led the club in, through a tough time and the way Stephen Cornelio led the club during a tough time one is obviously older than the other one's a lot more mm. experienced sloan has uh, been around for a while he's 30 um but you could bait for anyone who doesn't maybe fully appreciate what was happening um adelaide was going through a rebuild and went through 13 or something consecutive losses yeah um they had a good back half of the year but they're yeah. shit start yeah yeah and that was the first year they were really truly putrid so it was uncharted territory yeah. for adelaide and uh sloan was 
uh, unbelievable. He seems like an unbelievable guy. To be yeah, honest. class just, act. Yeah, just uh, super bubbly, super positive. Uh, I mean, a real leader, real tough mm. guy. Plays with a lot of heart. Uh, yeah, massive respect mm. for Larry Sloan. I always always respected him, but I, I, I would challenge anyone to watch it and not think of him yeah. very highly. And you could just, unfortunately, you can sort of contrast it with Canelo, who is a young guy who coming off his best season in 2019. Uh, that was where he established himself as a pretty much an elite player. He's uh-huh. one of the game's best midfielders in 2019, uh, and his side made the grand final that year. His form dropped off badly in 2020, and like you can script anyway, you can just they could choose to show whatever they want in the documentary. Yeah. So we don't necessarily have the full. Yeah, that's what I was going to say with the Canelo stuff. They were obviously going to mm. show the good stuff, not like. Well, yeah, but also the bad stuff, like. Yeah. For instance, we saw a lot of negative body language, uh, mm. a lot of group scenarios where he sort of got his head down and quiet. Leon yeah, Cohen's like addressing the group yeah. and his body language is just a bit like this. Mm. Um, then he, there's another point where he addresses the group um, talking about how his form is low. And while it's coming from the heart, and I know that he's... I, right. I do genuinely like Stephen Canelio, but he's just so low on confidence. He's mm. not projecting his voice at all. He's umming every second two words. It just looked like a guy who wasn't, wasn't doing the job well at the time. Mm. Now, Stephen Canelo is younger than me, so um, benefit of the doubt, he's going to learn from it. Um, and I'm definitely not saying strip him of the captaincy or anything <laughs> like that. I just thought you could see a great captain in Rory Sloan and you could see uh, Stephen Canelo not dealing with it well. Going forward, hopefully he's stronger for it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting takeaway from yeah. from the thing. And I'll, I'll, I like Canelo. Yeah. I hope he, hope he has a ripping year yeah. in 2021. Yeah. Um, the other interesting points for me were I thought the Nat Nui and Riley O'Brien yeah. um, story was interesting, mostly because when that happened, when O'Brien accidentally tweeted the, yeah. the game notes, uh, I didn't make too much of it. I never thought that Nat Nui would actually be pissed. Yeah. But if, as you can see yeah. in the doco, he's like seething. He's like, I'm going mm. to kill this fool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he kicks a goal and he goes, that's for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was cool. Like yeah. unreal uh, insight yeah. if you get into this as well. Um, and then Eddie Betts as well with his, yeah. Um, like, uh, psych- yeah, I guess the mental side of the game. Yeah. He made some interesting... Uh, Even dealing with, like, the racism side of stuff, yeah. like Eddie's perspective on that. Like, someone like Eddie's such a great spokesman for those sort of issues, I feel, because he's, like, just the average guy just sort of saying, this is what happens to me, like, doesn't try and, like, preach and carry on. Like, he just tells his yeah. message and says, this is what I have to deal with. He's yeah. a real honest bloke, and, like, he just gives off the thing that, like, he just genuinely cares about your oven a bit of an air of superiority and division. He just seems like a guy that cares about everyone. Yeah, he seems like one of the most likable players mm. in the AFL, to be honest. Like, watching it, it's just like, I barely know the guy, but, like, I could sit down and spill my heart out to him sort of thing. It feels <laughs> like he'd, like... he get lost like, in his eyes. Like, it feels like he would, like, genuinely care and, like, try and do everything in his power to, like, listen and help. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, it was really... Yeah, Betts is really likable, so such yeah. a like positive character, sort of guy you'd love to have a yeah. view with. He's the, a good advocate for these sort of issues. And yeah, stuff, I feel and, like. and it, comparing him to like a Goods or a Lumumba who can't like, I'm not saying they're wrong or anything, but they can come off as preachy and uh, yeah. condescending. And I guess what you're trying to say is like, Betts didn't try and blow anything out of proportion. Not that yeah. not that I'm saying that Goods yeah, or Lumumba did obviously. either, but it was just a very. Um, I won't say unemotional, but he was just like, yeah, this is the way it is. This makes me feel shit. And I yeah. just think that the way the way he spoke about it was quite compelling yeah. to someone who maybe doesn't understand what's what's going on. You could just say, like, there was no there's no mayonnaise. He was just speaking from the heart. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I like to think that I didn't need to learn anything from yeah. that, but I think potentially someone could have learned. Even if you're great and all that stuff, you can still learn all sorts of just different tidbits and anything mm. literally. Like, it's all valuable knowledge. Like, yeah. Even if you're like the most upstanding, perfect person to everyone sort of thing, you can still learn something about someone else that's mm. like yeah. insightful and makes you even better. No one's perfect. Yeah. So it's all good knowledge. and That's true. Yeah, it is just interesting to see that, you know, the footage of him scrolling through his phone, the monkey yeah. photo, it's like, yeah, that's cooked. Sure. Absolutely cooked. Especially seeing him with his family, like a beautiful, mm. wonderful family. Yeah, yeah, uh. yeah. Uh, so that was, yeah, all powerful. And again, they picked an amazing year for all those things to happen. Um, <laughs> not that that's an amazing thing to happen, but mm. I mean, uh, it was good that we saw something like that, that uh. insight. And it was good that it was, it was incredible that they chose the 2020 COVID year. Because uh. I was thinking while, while they were making this doco, like when COVID hit, do they think, shit, do we just have to can this doco now? Because that would have been under threat for sure. Uh. There was an episode where a lot of the footage was Skype footage yeah. uh, i think it was the second episode um yeah, yeah where they were like doing the logistics of yeah. COVID and stuff yeah, yeah so that would have thrown in 
throwing it into yeah. jeopardy. But anyway, we, we basically saw an amazing thing. So I would fully recommend um, checking out Amazon. I um I literally subscribed to Amazon and started paying for it purely for this um this docu series. So uh, again, no sponsor. <laughs> Excuse me. All the right. anti-sponsor, in fact. We've paid money to tell you about making the mark. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. We're in a yeah, ne- negative. Um, all right, cool. So now we'll talk a bit more about uh, 2021 footy. Um, Jai has asked what happened... Okay, so he asked this question before Geelong played Brisbane. So yeah. what happens to the loser of Geelong and Brisbane, given recent stats show teams go 0-2, either fail to make finals or they don't go very far. So yeah, 0-2 is a pretty... Uh, statistically, it's not a great way to start a season. Um and then he also asked, was it holding the ball in the dying seconds? But uh, I guess, Ooh, yeah. as we know... Yeah, okay, we'll start with that. Okay, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I... That's all I saw of the game, but it was definitely yeah. holding the ball. Stevie Wonder could have seen that was holding the ball. Complaining about the umpires is, like, the most uh, uncompelling thing ever. Like, it just sounds so lame. No one ever sounds good complaining about umpires. But what I'll say is last night, Brisbane were definitely robbed. Not only with that holding the ball in the goal square, um, there was also the one where... Stewart, I think it was Stewart, or Guthrie might have thrown the ball, uh, yeah, basically handed the ball to Selwood to keep the goal. Selwood got away with a couple of throws. Hawkins should have given away a 100-metre penalty. Anyway, won't fixate on that, but uh, yeah, no, Brisbane, very unlucky. They're now 0-2. What do you think that means for them, considering 0-2 is not a great way to start the year? I don't think it's a disaster for Brizzy, obviously. Like It's one of those things that's still... Like I even said at the start of the year, they'll still be good, and I think it'll be a harder path for them, and they'll finish lower. But that might ironically help their assault on finals. So, sort of going as I sort of predicted with them, I think they'll. How would it help their assault on finals? Well, I kind of think like the more adversity, even finishing lower and stuff, like they'll have more difficulty, but right, they'll attack finals better. I think just with the other year of confidence and experience, yeah. even if it doesn't reflect in as good a regular season, yeah, I think it'll reflect in a better finals performance, even if they finish lower. I think from a Brisbane perspective. Round one was a bad loss to Sydney. Sydney are talented. they are just gone seven points up on Adelaide. Um, don't get me wrong, they're talented, but it's not a game that on paper Brisbane should really be dropping at home to a team that may or may not make finals. Round two, the, the effort in that second half, the first half wasn't great. Second half was really compelling. Um, we saw a lot of fight from a team that hasn't won at GMHBA for 12 consecutive games now, but dating back to 2003. So... I chalked them up as a four-goal loss before really even thinking about too much about this game. So they, they exceeded my expectations, and that's why I'll say that on the basis of that last surge, they should have plenty of belief. It's not like they were no. disappointing in round two. Um, if they'd been one and one their season would be back to where you'd think it would be because yeah. you know they would have chalked up GMHBA as a loss as well. So, yeah, 0-2 is not great, but I do also think that stat is skewed by the fact that most teams that start 0-2 suck. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of teams... Like, Carlton haven't gone... They're the longest streak of 0 twos in history. Yeah, yeah. I forgot the how many years it is. Was it nine years? I think it's nine years. Something. Or something. They've gone 0 yeah. So uh, they haven't been in the eight. They haven't finished the eight. Yeah, sorry. They haven't finished around in the eight since 2013. <laughs> That's crazy. Classic. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. We'll talk more about uh, Fremantle, your boys. So um, as we record this, haven't played GWS yet. Um, Bruce basically wants to know, he directed this question at Lenny, Druzy, and yourself. Yep, um, um, you're the only one yes, here. Yep. Um, but he says... Uh, I'm the one Bruce really wants to hear from, let's be honest. Yeah. Where, where are Fremantle realistically at? Are finals realistic or are they still well off? And what happens when Fife and Walters retire? Are we facing another five-year rebuild? I think finals is realistic, but not going to happen. Year? It's realistic, like it's possible, but I don't think it'll happen. Mm. Like, I just think another year of few ups and downs, like... Mm. Throw the kids into some more precarious situations, let them sort of figure it out and develop from it. They're not going to. We're not be... talking about your personal life. <laughs> yeah, that's how I treat my kids. Just chuck them in the jungle and let them figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, that sort of thing. Like, I just think this year is going to be another year of really sticking in the long and mule system, like finding the guys that best suit that system out of our list because we've got a bit of depth around the team now. We have really got to figure out and settle on a twenty-two mm. for best suits what we want to do. And I think next year will be the year. I think um, I think personnel-wise, you're not that far off in the no. middle on the back half of the ground. Forward half. The forward half is a bit of a disaster, to be honest. Um, Tracy, I'm very, yeah. very optimistic about. Yeah, I agree. Um, I like Sturt as well. He's a yeah, likely like type as a sort of lead-up uh, medium-sized forward. Third tall type. But Tracy's, Tracy, Tracy's not played yeah. a game. So obviously we're talking yeah. about hypotheticals here um, and best-case scenario. So I just think... 
that, the, the list is just so unbalanced. Mm. That's the biggest threat to Fremantle here. It's hard to imagine a genuine tilt while Fife and Walters are in the on the list. So, I mean, how old's Fife turns 30 this year? So you're looking at maybe three or four years, potentially. Yeah. But that, that may be three or four years to get, you know, into finals twice in a row. Do you mm. know what I mean? To, then to push all the way. I, I love Cheryl and Brayshaw, to be honest. I think they're great. Obviously, you got Sarong. Yep. Uh, Hayden Young looks like a gem. Liam Henry, um, early days, but yep. obviously very talented. I think there's a lot of young talent on the list, and I think it gets overlooked at Fremantle because they're an easy team for people to forget about and discard. I think they've been mm. disrespected quite a lot. Admittedly, they haven't performed either, but I just think the talent the talent's better than people realise. But the forward half is yeah. it's a disaster at the moment. Um, Especially because our best forward is Matt Friggin Tabernacle. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> Who's uh, had one good season, really. Yeah, and even then it was like 33 goals, mm. which is nothing. It was amazing. fifth in the common that year, so like, oh, okay. give him all credit Fair due point. for last year, but other than that, he's proven nothing other than last year. Yeah, for I me. actually forgot for a second it was a shortened season, so yeah. that's actually, yeah, half decent. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think I think we're on the same page. I think the forward line... I, I, I'm not going to say five-year rebuild. I think things can change quickly in football now. You can you can change the dynamic of your team with a couple of good trades. Yeah. Um, it's just that Fremantle's need to be forward targets. Um, yeah. If they don't trade in a midfielder or a defender for the next tilt, I think they'll, that's okay. I think it's quite a good setup in that back half. But yeah, avenues to go, whether it be tall or whether it be medium or small, just mm. needs to... You need some natural right. kick. What do you think about a hypothetical Crips pursuit? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't argue against it. Mm. Bru- Crips, uh, Freeman will probably have the money. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say we'd be in the driver's seat over you guys, I'd guess. Yeah. Hope. but I Even mean, though you are having some retirements and stuff, but your midfield's already pretty... So whilst uh, with the Eagles, I believe there was a promise made to the players when they signed Tim Kelly that they wouldn't target another big fish because of all the pay cuts that the yeah. players had I think even Freo had a bit of a discussion like that as well where they said they wouldn't use the savings to go after someone right gotcha um, so yeah look I, my belief is Cripps wouldn't go anywhere and if he did mm. my gut feels West Coast because he was a big West Coast fan and he'd be chasing success and I just think uh, that's where he would prefer to play for mm. and the thing is no one's outbidding Carlton because he, he's yeah. more valuable to Carlton than anyone else yeah and I just don't think Crips would leave. Mm. Uh, but from a Fremantle perspective, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's a viable option uh, in terms of like, yeah, I'm not going to yeah. argue against going after Paddy Crips. It might cost you so someone yeah. though. Does it cost you an Adam Chera? Because mm. that would suck. Yeah, that but, would. Yeah. What was Chera top three in your BNF or something? He was up there. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think he yeah. was pretty high. So yeah. I, I think Chera's a gun. Um, oh yeah, I would. I would. I would definitely. Uh, put the feelers out there yeah. and then it would sort of open up five to play more of a full-time forward role yeah. is that the best case scenario though but who mm. knows um all right now we'll move on to another michael stanton question he wants to know our thoughts on the mro so in particular he highlights dangerfield selwood and rowan um you didn't catch the game last night so you might not be able to comment on that but what did you think of the danger situation he cut two week, three weeks uh, it was he cut three weeks yeah. he? he sort of like yeah. led a bit with the bump like the way he sort of went into it he like based on the strict interpretation of the rule, he sort of broke the rule. So he sort of yeah, I do think the crime, do the time. It's tough because uh, it doesn't look like a dangerous football act to anyone maybe five years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it, 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 even now, it's not. A, you can't. I don't blame Dangerfield for what happened. Yeah. But if the rules are in place to protect against concussions, and that's exactly what it happened. Yeah. It was a concussion. Um, and a brutal one by the looks. Mm. His uh, eyes looked like they were rolled back to the bottom. Uh, Undertaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I think I mean the rule states that um, if you choose to bump, you're responsible for anything that happens. I think Dangerfield's unlucky because they clashed heads, and it could have been Dangerfield that got knocked out. Uh. As it turns out, Dangerfield has the ha- a, um, a head like a cat, <laughs> and um, it's extremely hard. Who just kicked a the goal there? Was it Sydney Heaney? Good for my fantasy team. Uh, okay. As it just turned out, uh, Dangerfield's got a rock solid head, yep. um, and he, yeah, it's hard to imagine him get knocked out, but it could have happened either way. Um, Ultimately, I think I would have said two weeks, mm. but I think I think he got three from the from memory. Yeah, he got three because I think it was going to be two if he just copped it, but he tried to appeal, so he copped the yeah. three. Did you see the Gary Rowan hit on Instagram? Nah. Oh, so he's standing standing with Neil. Um, yeah. Neil's uh, sort of he turns around and sort of gives him a high push yeah. on the shoulder, and you can tell it agitates him. And then Neil, and Rowan's standing right behind Neil, 
like here yeah. and he like coat hangers him <sighs> and he doesn't hit him high yeah. which is the difference between him and Andrew Gaff yeah. um, Andrew Gaff obviously got Brayshaw right in the jaw yeah. but he, so he gets him here and then Neil's admittedly touching his jaw but I don't it doesn't look like he punches I, him I read a thing that said Neil could get done for staging if like yeah, Rowan's charges are diminished or something yeah I don't I don't think that's I don't yeah. think that's a good idea <laughs> yeah. it definitely doesn't look like a stage yeah. he hits him pretty hard yeah um, I was watching on was it no it wasn't on the catch there was I forget the show it was some show last night and they were thinking one week for Rowan I was seeing yeah. uh, Neil puts his fingers up and goes yet in three for that <laughs> it's, yeah it's probably I saw Neil was chirping with bloody Chris Scott at half time or quarter time or whatever yeah Chris Scott yeah. was getting frustrated yeah. by the looks he had to be he had to be pulled away old Chris yeah yeah um but just sorry, just to comment specifically on the on the Rowan thing, it might not have hit hard. Neil gets back up, doesn't go off the field, but I think it's a bad look for the game, and you can't not address when somebody belts someone behind the play. It was about hundred yeah. meters off the ball, yeah. so I think a week is about right. Mm. To be honest, now, yeah. now that I've had time to reflect, I think I said two or three last night, but I, yeah. I think one's good to send a message. Um, and then the Selwood one is um, you wouldn't have seen it, but he basically tackles I think Tom Berry. And then Tom Berry goes limp because the ball's been stopped. Like, yeah. the umpire's call for it. Selwood looks at the umpire and then smacks him into the ground. Ooh. Now, he doesn't hit him high. It's not like a... Yeah. Not a dangerous tackle in the sense that his head was protected. But it was a bit of rough conduct. Yeah. And it, it looked like a player who was frustrated. So Selwood was in pretty average form last night, I think, yeah. in terms of just flailing around. And, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that, that was just... A, like, he's, he's one of the best tacklers in the game. And... It was a shit tackle, and yeah. yeah, I don't know. It wasn't a good look. I'd say a fine mm. um, for those wondering about my opinion on that. Um, but I guess uh, in terms of your opinion on the MRO generally, um, Michael says I think the AFL should suspend intentional actions more harshly. So um, I take it maybe he thinks um, I'm either because with the criteria, it's like enough. impact and intentions the two they sort of go off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, but yeah. impacts the higher rated out of the two criteria they use to determine a punishment. Yes. Yeah. In terms of yeah. like uh, intention gets diminished if a player yeah. gets concussed, it's less important. Yeah, yeah. it's Hence the damage more than the intention. Whereas yeah. I probably agree with Michael and say intention should be more elevated yeah. in the scale of consideration. It's just harder to quantify, mm. right? So like, how can you really tell what a player is trying to do? But what you can't you can't deny is when a player gets concussed. Yeah. That's that's my only real explanation for yeah. why that's the system, and it's the same as our legal system, right? Mm. Like if you belt someone, yeah, their yeah. head hits the concrete. If they bounce straight back up, you're fine. But if they break their jaw or they die, you're done. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, it's not a perfect system, but it, it's also right. there's difficulties. So yeah. Um, all right, we'll move on. Uh, Bruce wants to know uh, with regard to Matty Rao has obviously done his PCL I think confirmed. it's not a full year it's going to be like 8 10 yeah. weeks or something yeah that's yeah. PCL um, people are talking about how you know is he ever going to get on the park so that's what Bruce that's the path Bruce is going down he says is it the, the biggest loss of potential in history if his injuries cons uh, concerns continue um, and if not who else is another candidate I was going to say, it's still a bit of wait and see with Rao because I think if he gets past his PCL and comes back out, plays out the season, then can go yeah. healthy from there, it's not really going to be too much of an issue in terms mm. of his whole career. But someone who was a big example of that lost potential, Morabito, was a yeah. classic one from the Dockers. Yeah. Real high pick. Looked great when he was on the park, the few times he did get on the park before his knees were absolutely decimated. Yeah. So someone like that's a good example. Yep, I agree. Even Harley Bunnell, but he's potential was wasted for some other reasons. He was injured. He had no, injuries. Injury as well, yeah. Yeah, but also a bit of his own fault. I'll, I'll count it. Uh, yeah. Harley Bunnell's super talented. Um, just for my take on Rao, it's two very unlucky impact injuries. And non-related. They're not... Yeah, shoulder so doesn't impact the knee. So if he was doing his knee once or twice, if he had concussion injuries, that, that would concern me more. I remember, not that Luke Shuey was the same level of talent as Rao seems to be, but... Um, Luke Shuey had a terrible first season as well. I think uh, he had osteitis pubis when he came over and then he played a couple of games uh, and then I want to say he did his knee and then there was also glandular fever in there as well. Um, he might have even broken a leg in there somewhere. Maybe it was a broken leg, not a knee. Yeah. Anyway, he played like six games in his first two years and um, people were like, this guy, is he having any on the park? He barely really missed too much footy since. So players 
while they might seem injury cursed at stages, they do get past it sometimes. And I'm obviously really hope that happens with Matthew Rowe. Seems like a great kid beyond anything Class else. Class act, yeah. Do like, even mean- bit with the Stewie G footage back to making your mark quickly, like, just getting to see, like, the way Rao operated a bit with some of that footage and mm. stuff was a bit of a good insight. Yeah, yeah. I, I It's hard not to like Matthew Rao. Yeah. I'm not ultra convinced he's this super, super talent. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So, I think it's outstanding what he's able to do as an 18-year-old, but that doesn't always translate to being, like the best player in the game you know like I'm not convinced he's necessarily going to be better than Bailey Smith I'm a big Bailey Smith yeah. fan it's a wait and see on that uh, but he's a very very good player um, but anyway I didn't mean to talk him down it was just more like is it the biggest waste of potential well like, we'll see yeah <laughs> the jury's still out on him yeah I'll nominate a few other players that I remember um, injury slash other things ruin their potential uh, Liam Jara mm-hmm. uh, one of the more, most talented players um, machete man yeah, yeah. So obviously, I don't think that was injury, was it? It was. Um, off yeah, did, he did have some injury issues, I believe. Yeah, I just don't remember what it was that ruined his yeah. career. But yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I think fair to say one of the more talented ones. A couple of Eagles examples. Michael Gardner was a f- number one pick, um, and then I think there was ACLs around that 2005, mm-hmm. 2006 period. Um, never really reached its potential, but was considered mm-hmm. like there was a time where yeah, Gardner was the good one, yeah. and Cox we were hoping we we're going to develop yeah, into yeah. a good player. Cox reached his potential, Gardner didn't. Yeah, I remember when Gardner was rocking over Cox. Yeah, those really yeah. Early days. And you've just given me inspiration for another good example, Justin Longmuir. Oh, really? Pick two, had lots of injuries, had to retire in mid-20s. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He retired pretty young, yeah. hey. Um, yeah, good And he point. was a talented top two pick. Probably tall. doesn't compare to Matthew Rao, but yeah, not I, I get what you're saying, yeah. yeah. Um, Ashley Samp is another one for us. Dale Garlett, uh, yeah, again, Dale. nothing to do with injuries, but um, a bit of a super talent. I, mean, I was doing a bit of research last night. A lot of people... S- People romanticise the brother thing, right? But mm. people saying like, Nathan. Nathan Ablett was <laughs> even more talented than Gary. And it's like, well, let's not romanticise it. People said the same thing about Scott Selwood being the most talented Selwood. It's more Nathan Ablett was just more key position size. Yeah, he was. But I think there was also some injuries involved in that. Yeah, he had injuries yeah. and stuff. But I meant yeah. people saying he's more talented half of it was probably just because he was right. key position size versus oh, okay. Gary Ablett. I get what you're saying. Eyes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was a bit young to really assess Nathan mm. Ablett's talent. Me too. It's hard to imagine he was more talented than Gary, but... Yeah, this is pure conjecture from me. Yeah. I, I'll say Scott Selwood is a player that could have been a very high-level midfielder, but he just busted his ankle at the wrong time and, yeah, just d- didn't come back the same player. And uh, while he's probably not as good as Joel, um, just a player that comes to mind. Uh, Tom Swift is another one Swifty. who... Didn't Dr. Come, Swift. Came back from his... Um, Appendicitis, a completely okay. different player. Um, went from like a uber gun to an uber spud. Um, but yeah, hard to imagine any of those eclipsing Matthew Rao if, uh, yeah, if uh. he doesn't get on the park again and be like, wow, what a waste of talent. Um, we'll move on to Scoobs Ahoy's question. Do you think that someone other than a midfielder can win the Brownlow and who are some of the candidates to do so outside of midfielders? Um, and I'll shout out Dominic here, uh, Fallen Sports. He makes a good point and mentions Hawkins was conceivably the best player last year. Hmm. Um, but what are your thoughts on this? It's going to be difficult for someone to pinch it off a midfielder. Obviously, the refs, umpires, are just going to predominantly see midfielders because they're going to stoppages, ball to ball. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah, It's always been a midfielder's award, really. Mm. I think you realistically your best shot to be a ruck. To yeah. take it like Grundy and Gorn have been in the thick of it the mm. past few years they haven't been like top five top ten sort of finishes for the pair of them yeah I think if anyone's going to do it it'd probably be Iraq yep unless a key forward just has a monumental year where they're just kicking well, but Buddy didn't win it in 08 and yeah. so certainly he would have been better than uh, Cooney yeah. that year um, but that's the way it goes yeah um, I yeah I, I pretty much agree it's hard to imagine just because simply that no one other than midfielders polls well. If, mm. if it was close every year and, you know, a, a key forward or key defender was coming fourth yeah. and third, I'd be like, yeah, definitely it happened. But even when Grundy and Gorn at the peak of their powers, were they cracking the top ten? Probably barely. Yeah. Maybe Grundy the was bottom top six the top, yeah. or something. I, I don't know off the top of my head. But if Grundy wasn't winning it in, like, that 18, 19 kind of yeah. period, um, it's hard to imagine mm. anyone else doing it. Hawkins, again, last year, conceivably um, MVP. Um uh, Nat Nui is another funny one where mm. uh, like he he was he had an incredible year last year. Uh, I don't he wouldn't have polled well at all. I saw an interesting thing. It was like where they had a coaches survey and they said he was the most like rock, mm. best rock. Yeah, yeah. The coaches felt Nick Nat. Um, and he won our best and fairest, which yeah. is uh, like for people saying Nat Nui is overrated. 
fair enough if that's your opinion. But twenty everything up until twenty twenty was different to twenty twenty. Twenty twenty he definitely went up a, a few levels. If you didn't catch the Eagles uh-huh. much in twenty twenty, there was a big difference in the way that he he played um, and his impact. I'll nominate some other players. I I think yeah. Tony Lockett, like it used to be a Ruckman's award, like Jimmy Steins right. won the Brownlow. Yeah. Um, Tony Lockett won the Brownlow in the yeah. late 90s, I think it was. So it did happen previously, but I think it's just more of a midfielder's award yeah. now. But I'll, I'll mention some other non-mids. There's two. There's Lucky Whitfield, hmm. who obviously hasn't really returned to that 2019 form, but wins enough of the ball and is impactful and dangerous enough that I could see him pulling three hmm. votes enough to go close. And yeah not really a midfielder, more like a high half forward, maybe running defender. Um, the other one, I'll, this is a bit of a cheater one, but I was going to say Dusty because yeah. he plays a lot of forward and yeah, I could yeah. see him playing half a year, sorry, more than half the year forward and getting enough three vote games. Yeah. So yeah, don't know if that one counts. Um, <laughs> Wheatfield's probably a better example. Long story short, probably not. <laughs> um, so lucky Neil, basically. We've got a few quick fire ones. <laughs> yeah, lucky Neil. Um, <laughs> we got a few quick fire ones uh, to round out the pod. So Javka wants to know, if you could change one moment in AFL history, what would it be? We'll t- we briefly talked about this one off air. I had, I had two of our nominated. One was Freo winning in 2013, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then the other one was Freo winning the prelim against Sydney in 2006. So we would have gone into the grand final against West Coast. Oh, you like losing Derby in the grand final, do you? <laughs> would have been a good have a chance to versus in our first ever grand final. You did beat us twice that year. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I'd like to think we would have lifted. I felt confident that year, but I was bloody eight or however old I yeah. was. So what did I know back then? Yeah. I wish. What do I know now? <laughs> I wish you'd beaten uh, Hawthorne in the 2015 prelim because I think we would have definitely won that game if you'd yeah. played. I think. I, was, I reckon we would have had a better shot no six and 15. Just, yeah, I would I yeah. would agree with that. I think by the end of 15, you were cooked and yeah. you took that form into 2016 as well. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, for me, probably the 05 grand final, Leo Barry yeah. taking that mark. But... To be honest, I don't even know how much of that last quarter I watched. I don't think I really cared about football until the next year. Yeah. So, And it made more special because I was actually at 06, yeah. so I probably wouldn't even change that. And one, yeah. one that comes to mind for me is Gaff hitting Brayshaw. Yeah, that's, I wish I could yeah. undo that, to be honest. Yeah, that was one of the more... That was one of the... Uh, it sounds really melodramatic, but emotionally, that was one of yeah. the more emotional games in a negative way that I've ever been to because we were right at the thick of a premiership assault. Uh, yeah. I think Nat Nussi did his ACL the week before. yeah. I think it was a week before, or it was, it was a close. couple of weeks before. It was around it was the same time. Ballpark, yeah. And uh, I just remember being at home at the dinner table after Dad had gone to bed and just sitting like this going, oh, my God, and just feeling yeah. terrible. So, and, yeah, there was a lot of emotional pain for everyone involved in that game. So, yeah, I, I would definitely undo that if I could. Yeah. Um, Sabre, Sabre Racer says, if you could play in a famous game, which game would you play in? Ooh. That derby that turned into a big scrap would be a bit of fun. Demolition Derby in 01. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a fun one. Uh. Derby 48. Captain <laughs> um, uh, I mean, for me, it's hard to go past the 18 grand final. Well, that'd be a fun game. Um, be a yeah, part. very biased there. A couple other grand finals that were amazing were uh, 16, probably for the narrative of it. Um, a lot of people talk about the umpires in that game, the right. Bulldogs betting Sydney. It was... I don't remember. I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so I just remember having an amazing time watching it. Um, yeah. And the the moment that siren went for the Dogs fans, it would have been an amazing game to be part of. I just remember being pissed Tom Boyd didn't win the Norm Smith. <laughs> yeah. 2012, Sydney beating Hawthorne. That was one of my favourite grand finals ever. Uh, mm. It would, be, would have been good to be on the winning side in that one. One of the worst games, I think, to be involved in was probably the 2010 grand final draw. Because uh-huh. no one... No one leaves that happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, particularly for Saints because they got belted the next week. Uh, and one I'll mention is uh, it's easy to answer this for my own team because I don't remember all the games. But in 06, the Eagles came back from 54 points down and deep in the third to beat Geelong at Cardinia. That was the yeah. last time we won there. So I Another fun one if I had to pick one for 2020 would be that Saints game where Freo were down 36 at the yeah. end of the first quarter. That'd be a fun one to yeah. play in. Yeah. Similar vein to that suggestion. Yeah, true. That was, I think, the biggest comeback from last year. Yeah. Uh For sure. Larry the Lobster. All right, he's got a hypothetical for us. Larry the Lobster, famously an Eagles fan. He wants to know... I think this question's directed at me, but we can flip it either way. Yeah, it's Derby Premiership related. Yeah. So if you could win the next 10 years of Derby, so that's 20 Derbies, assuming no more COVID. 20 Derbies, would you win those in a row if you could if it meant Fremantle or West Coast so the opposite team yeah. won three flags in t- a 10 year period 
I'd live it because we don't have any guaranteed success in any other area, so I'd take me 20 straight derbies Would even you? if he's winning three flags. But, yeah, at least we flogged his in the derby while he was yeah. winning flags. Yeah, I feel like this is... Yeah, this is... um, It's a way to get brownie wait. points off the other team's success. Let me just double-check the question. Does he say... Or would you rather... Yeah, I swore that was a bit... Wait, no, no, I think it's a, it's an or. It's an or. Maybe, maybe it's 20 derbies in a row and the other team wins three flags. Or would you rather three flags yourself and lose 20 derbies? That does change it, does it? Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, because he's asked us, West Coast go 10 years in a row beating Freo in the derby, but Doc has win three flags. Yeah, or... But it's a choice. It has to be or. Okay, yeah. Or you win three flags and lose 20 derbies. I think yeah. I think if it's an or that changes it completely. Yeah, you would definitely choose three flags, right? Yeah, because the or is your team wins three premierships in a row, but you only beat you don't win the derby in that time. You only beat them once during that period. Is the uh, it was it three? Der- it was, I've got it in front of you. three premierships in a row. Oh, yeah. three premierships in a row. Yeah, it's would you rather have West Coast go 10 years in a row beating Fremantle without losing a derby, but the Dockers win three flags, or yeah. West Coast win three flags? But only beat Fremantle once in that ten year period. Oh no, you choose three flags every yeah, day of the week. Yeah, fuck yeah. I was thinking yeah. it was a I choice did. between twenty consecutive derby losses and three flags, basically, because that's probably a bit more interesting. I'd yeah. probably, I think it still comes. I take the three flags. You got to take the ultimate success. You're taking yeah. the flags. Fuck it. Yeah. yeah. Although, yeah, that would mean we're far behind you in the derby ledger, but we'd have seven premierships. Yeah. So I would. You'd be far ahead in the premiership ledger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it this way. Huh? Would you lose the next ten derbies if it meant? Um, no, there's a better way to flip it. Actually, would you win? Would you rather? Um, this is getting very uh, cerebral. No, nah. <laughs> would you take the next ten derby wins in a row if it meant the Eagles win the flag this year? Yeah, I guess because we're probably not a good shout at winning it this year. So, so that's probably the difference between the two clubs. I wouldn't do that deal. I no. wouldn't allow Fremantle to win the flag for the sake of ten more Derby wins in a row. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Because I think I mean yeah. we're in the thick of the hunt. I mean, I say that now. We'll yeah, that's what I mean. Use like a team that's set up to be contending right yeah. now. And you just saw us win a flag just two, yeah, three years exactly. ago. Exactly. So it is and different. That, and like I said earlier in the potty, out my team's a year or two away. I think from realistically. Yeah. Being in the thick of it, so I could live with us. Yeah, winning some derbies in that time, and you winning a flag, but you're in contention for anyway. Yeah, a, a Fremantle flag would hurt Eagles fans more than the opposite. It would yeah. hurt more than an Eagles flag to Fremantle fans because you've seen it four yeah. times. <laughs> um, all right, Jack and asked. This is probably the um, most thought-provoking question of the day. He says, "If you could be any mythical creature, what is it, and why is it a mermaid?" I'll back him in with the mermaid, but I'm going to put a twist on it. You know that Family Guy episode where there's the mermaid, but it's the fish top half and the... I have this exact answer. I literally wrote that down. (laughs) What? what? I literally said... I was like, yeah, I I would rather keep my genitals though, so take my arms, I'll just be a fish upper body. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I can't believe that. Yeah, that Family Guy bit, because it's like, have you seen that bit on Family Guy? Yeah, that must be where we got inspired. Yeah. Yeah, that's so funny. (laughs) I literally have that written down. Um... Dominic rounds out the podcast by asking, who is the best team and why is it Hawthorne? <laughs> Dominic is a staunch Hawthorne man. Yep. And uh, I'm saying some of his comments throughout yeah, the years. They're Dom. all very pro Hawthorne. I yep. admire his passion. He's the most optimistic fan um, yep. I uh, I think I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah, good on him. Yep. Uh, and thanks for your contributions, everyone, um, to True 40 Podcast 72. Uh, it's been real. It's been good. I'll give him this one little real. naughty. I'll say they've been the best run team of the 21st century. Oh, yeah. I'll give him that. The best run team? Yeah, the best Ooh. organ. Yeah, I get it. I get it. It's hard to go past Richmond's last 10 years, mm. but I understand that the first 10 years in the, the, the millennium yeah. were um, El Butolio, yeah. <laughs> as they say. Because even Hawks weren't great early, but they used the early of that 21st century to set up. For they the weren't rest. as putrid as Richmond, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. Hawthorne. Um, yeah. The best team of the millennium. Probably the best team of the 80s as well. Yeah, Just definitely. A really strong club. He's really tricked us into complimenting Hawthorne again. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sweet, guys. Uh, we're going to wrap up the pod there. Thank you for your contributions. Um, keep an eye out for just the tips every week. Um, Bush, are you are keeping your NBA content up on uh, Outback Hoops? Absolutely. Experience? Got a trade deadline coming up probably in the next week or so. Yep. Because we've just had the trade deadline in the NBA. So if you want to hear my boy Frosty basically verbally wank over how well the Miami Heat did in the trade deadline. Just verbally. Have a gaze.
Yeah, nice one. Um, the link to your NBA channel is in every video, yep. so the description of every video, so uh, that's where you can find that. Yeah, that's um, something I've got to do at some stage, just do like the typed up thing, just so I've got something ready to go for each thing. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Um, also, uh, Cold World. We just did a new Cold World with starring Young Druzy as well, so um, link to that is in the description as well. So, um, the Young really Ponkasaurus. Yeah, really appreciate um, you guys checking out that content. I uh, hope it's been good, and we'll see you in the next one. Catch you next time.